and we're really fortunate tonight to have uh, Dr. Alyssa Antel. Dr. Antel is an associate professor in our School of Interactive Arts and Technology. It's a very cool place, believe me. It's at our Surrey campus. Uh, she's an expert in interactive design for children. Her research focuses on embodied human-computer interaction, child-computer interaction, and the design and evaluation of interactive technologies to support children's development in a variety of areas. And like you, I am really curious to find out what this is all about. Uh, one of her current projects is developing multi-sensory interactive tablet computer technology to help dyslexic children learn to encode words and letters. She also leads the Grand NCE National Kids Project, an industry academic network of researchers working on the design, evaluation, and social impact of interactive media for children. She recently won the uh, Device Best Practice Award. This European award recognizes Dr. Antle's work in creating the developmentally situated design card set an aid that provides age-specific information about children's development of cognitive, physical, social, and emotional abilities readily accessible to designers. And I understand the award ceremony is going to take place in Italy in March, so congratulations. What a great place to go get an award. Uh, before she joined SFU, uh, Dr. Antle worked in new media. She was executive producer and creative director for cbcforkids.ca and a consultant on the first North American integrated web-based TV show, CBC Spy Kids. Uh, so we're in for a pretty exciting and tech-savvy lecture tonight on the topic, Can an App Aid Education and Poverty? So with that, please uh, give a very warm, warm welcome uh, to Dr. Elisa Antle. Thank you. Thanks for coming tonight. Uh, when I was asked to give this talk, I had to decide which of my projects to talk about. And uh, since the President's Lecture Series is about showing SFU's impact in the world, I decided on this one, which investigates if brain-computer application can help some of the world's poorest children um, succeed at school. So it's a, it's a project that's still in progress, so I don't actually know the answer yet. But if we get positive results, there's a potential there to affect children all over the world, including Canada. So the question of how we provide education for the world's poorest children has been addressed by many, many groups. Um, and, but even with access to education, many children are unable to focus on learning due to multiple traumas they have suffered in poverty. These include things like parental mental illness, homelessness, civil war, it's a long list. So I'm asking a slightly different question, and that is uh, how can we help some of the world's poorest children succeed at school once they've been given access to it? So addressing this question helps us support millions of children who may have trouble focusing at school, and they can't become educated if they can't do that. So I'm going to talk about a recent trip that I took to Nepal where I found a need for a brain-computer interface in a very unlikely location, which was a school that works with vulnerable children in the slums of Pokhara. I'll start by talking about some clinical research, and it's going to look at um, Eastern meditation and mindfulness techniques that have been used to treat trauma in the West. So that's one strain of research. And then I'll move on and talk about research and interactive technologies that help us design brain-computer interfaces to video games. And then I'll put those two things together based on solving a problem I found while I was in Nepal. So there's 2.2 billion children in the world. And the estimate right now is that about one, one billion of those children live in poverty. That means they live on less than $2.50 a day. And according to UNICEF, 22,000 children die every day from poverty. Nepal is one of the poorest countries in the world. According to UNICEF, over one third, or about 4.5 million kids there, live in abject poverty, which means they're living on a dollar a day or less. 10% of the kids there don't attend school. And poverty is highest in the hill regions, the rural regions, and in families where parents don't attend school. And this, um, these characterize Pokhara, where I was. There's also been a lot of civil war there, and so um, it's been a very difficult place for children. 
so it's not that children from these situations are unable to learn. It's that they're not available to learn yet. And so what children really need is help learning how to calm themselves and be able to focus. Solving this problem will help not only children in Nepal, but worldwide, from child soldiers in Africa to children with ADHD in Vancouver. Mindfulness. So it's all the latest buzz. Eckhart Tolle to Deepak Chopra. Mindfulness is showing up on TV, on the radio, on DVDs, and even in the app store recently. So what's it all about? Who does it help? Um, John Kabat-Zinn at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, he brought, really brought mindfulness techniques to the West and studied them in a clinical setting and worked and created an eight-week program that showed significant improvement in adult people's ability to deal with chronic pain, anxiety, depression, and trauma, recovery from trauma. So based on his work and others, this approach did become one of the best clinical practices in the West for dealing with trauma. There's really several aspects to mindfulness, and usually when people think about it, they just think about the focusing on the present moment, and that is part of it. But I'm actually going to focus on a different part, which is our ability to self-regulate our emotions. So to do a, a, quick, a quick version of a complicated phenomena, I'm really interested in how people self-regulate to calm themselves and also to focus on tasks. Both of these, of course, are required if children are going to succeed at school. Self-regulation involves two parts of the brain. And to put it simply, there's a reptile part and a primate part. So mindfulness practice helps reduce the activity in the amygdala, that's the brain's emotional center, that's responsible for fear and stress response, like fear, flight or fight. Um, mindfulness practice, so it, it's our reptile brain. We're very reactive. Um, and mindfulness practice also helps us deal with our executive functioning area in our prefrontal cortex, or up here. And this is where we um, plan, where we make decisions. It's our rational mind. You can think of it like our primate brain. And it helps us regulate our emotional reactions. So learning mindfulness helps us to be able to consciously respond in a rational way more than just react like a reptile. That's the short version of what happens. OK, so how do we do this? Um, training turns out that training your brain is like training your muscles. So um, instead of training muscles, we're just laying down neural patterns. And they're going to reinforce particular behaviors. And in this case, we want our prefrontal cortex to mediate our emotional responses. Like learning to ride a bike, repeated practice leads to automation of the process. We strengthen the neural connections, and we get better and better at doing this. OK. How do we learn to do this? Sounds easy so far. Um, so ser learning self-regulation requires techniques that will enable us to regulate our emotions. We use breathing and meditation and yoga. These practices come out of the Eastern tradition. Eventually, we may get a feel for how to calm ourselves, how to sustain prolonged focus. And the more we practice, the more the process becomes automated. But it takes a lot of practice, years and years for most people. So how many of you have tried learning to meditate or learn yoga? And uh, how, how hard was that? <laughs> so it's pretty hard to learn these things. Um, we're dealing with our internal mind and our internal body states. The techniques are hard to teach, they're hard to learn, and they're hard to know if you're getting it right. Now, what if you could have feedback that knows what's going on inside your brain? And it might help you with that a little bit. What do you think? So here's where brain-computer interfaces come in. Advances in computer technology, as well as our understanding of the human brain, have resulted in the development of new technologies that can be really used to provide a window into what's happening in our brains. The reason a brain-computer interface works at all is because of the way our brains function. Our brain's neurons, shown in the picture, communicate with each other with small electric signals that zip from neuron to neuron as fast as 400 kilometers an hour. These signals are generated by differences in electric potential carried by ions on membranes, and we don't need to know more about that. Every time, what you do need to know is that every time we think, we move, we feel, we remember, some specific pattern or group of neuron fires. And the more that group is used, the more it fires, the stronger it gets. And it turns out we can sense these things. So um, in the, neuron, the neuron's electric signals, 
can be sensed by an EEG sensor, and it picks up some of these escaped electronic signals that come out through our skull. Um, it captures this information, and then it can send it wirelessly to a computer application. So we get a direct pathway between the brain and software on a computer. Turns out there's five types of brain waves we care about, and the Greeks get to name everything, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, theta. So the wave, the wavelengths, though, and waves per second or hertz, actually characterize features, and the EEG can pick these up. And so it turns out that things like slower brain waves, like lower alpha and theta, indicate that our brain is in a relaxed or meditative state. Slightly faster waves, like upper alpha, um, which is around 10 to 14 hertz, um, identify attentive states. And then as we move even higher speeds into beta waves, we get anxious thinking. So we have an ability to understand what's going on in our brains using EEG technology. We get a window, basically, to see what's happening. Okay, so um, we can use that. We can send the output from that to a screen, and this fellow here is looking at his brain waves, and he's using that um, to try and understand what's happening in his body. However, children are not going to be able to use this system. So a commercially available system called Neuro by made by NeuroSky just came out quite recently, and they're still working on it. Um, but it turns out that this system is a little more robust, a little bit easier to use for children, and we've tested it with my children, among other people. And it appears that um, this system is robust enough for children to use. Okay, so with kids, though, we're not going to show them graphs of their brain waves. That's not really going to help them too much. Um, but neurofeedback training systems tend to use games because games are motivating for children. They understand how they work and what to do, and so that makes it pretty easy. So the child's brain state is fed into the game, and the game changes something in the game mechanics, the rules, the procedures in the game, and outputs that, and the children recognizes it, and then continues to change their body state or their mind state, and round and round the the feedback loop goes. So this is called neurofeedback. Recently, they've been using these for kids that have, um, have suffered from trauma as well as anxiety. And there's been clinical studies that show they work as well as other techniques. But of course, the kids enjoy them more. And because they enjoy them more, they practice them more. And the more you practice, the better you get at riding your bike. OK. so. Uh, there's been lots of studies with adults, um, and it's important to notice here that most of the studies have been with adults, and all of the studies have been done in the first world, and most of them in the United States. Okay, time to go to Nepal. Jump on a plane. Here we go. Um, I happen to be in Kathmandu because I was asked by a Dutch researcher if I would give two workshops for older children in some private schools there and teaching them design process around interactive technology. So these kids are not children living in poverty. They are the children who will grow up to be, to run the corporations, to be the government. And so I agreed to do this project, and there I was. And when I was all done, I decided to take a few days off and go to um, Pokhara, which is near the Annapurna Range, and I'm a bit of an outdoor buff, so that seemed fun. Of course, I didn't actually get a vacation. Um, so many things in life start with conversations, and this one is like that. I'd arranged to meet a friend of a friend there. Her name was Leslie Chesick. She's a clinical supervisor and therapist for Family Services in Greater Vancouver, but she also vol volunteers her time for a nonprofit in Nepal that works with kids in the slums, and she trains the counselors there in best practices from the West in counseling children. But the basic idea was, hey, there's someone you know, and they'll take you out for lunch. So off we went, and we had lunch. And so she told me what they were trying to do at the school there. There's Leslie, and she told them where they were having a lot of trouble. And so what they're trying to do um, is basically work with kids there that are too poor to go to the free school. That seems a little strange, but it turns out that it takes a lot of work to go to the free school. For example, you need money for uniforms, and you need to know how to brush your hair and be there on time. And if you're not, you're beaten and sent home. So it's not very motivating for a lot of kids. So the, the staff at this school takes kids who can't succeed in the free, in the free school, and they find that these girls are living in poverty, so they're often malnourished, they have very few life skills, and most of them have suffered complex traumas. So the staff, trained by Leslie, have been trying to incorporate practices into the from the West, in, 
such as self-regulation techniques, including deep breathing and yoga. The challenge they faced here is exemplified by a quote from one of the counselors there, and I quote, when we started the school, we had 12 girls, aged three to six. Their hygiene was so bad, they had sores all over their bodies, they were always hungry and dirty, and they were beaten daily by their parents. It was so hard to control them. They would run from the class and try and run away down the street. They hit each other, swore all the time, would bite themselves and others, and they'd get so upset that they would pee themselves. So as Leslie told me about this, I had crazy idea was forming in the back of my mind, and I found myself saying to her, well, what if? What if you could use neurofeedback games designed for these children to provide some sort of help to support this, what the teachers were doing and teaching them self-regulation? And so the project began. I also wondered, not only could it help the kids, but it, could it help the counselors uh, monitor the kids' progress and see how they were doing over time? So those became the two key research questions. So when I got home, I put together a team of students. They're almost all undergrad students, except for one. And undergrad students in the school I work in are very good at designing crazy systems. And um, I also hired a grad student who's good at doing research. So we put together a small team, and we decided to see what we could do. So you can't really start this research. Oh, and I needed some funding, so I pulled some funding together from here or there in my back pocket. Um, so you can't really do research until you have the system, a system, and then you need to go test it with the kids. So we decided to design and build a neurofeedback-based system specifically for these kids. And in theory, this is my specialty. And there were a few minor details to work out in the beginning. We had to use a tablet because it's robust, has long battery life, the power goes out for days at a time there. It's harder to break, it's portable, the kids can go sit in the corner. We had to figure out how to get brainwave data into a game engine on the Android tablet. Technically, it, caused, it was a little bit of a challenge, but I'm getting ahead of myself because the real challenge had nothing to do with technology. Okay, we start with a standard design process and we go through iterative cycles. The very first thing that we needed to do um, was that we needed to understand the context that these kids came from. So as designers, we sort of make implicit assumptions, and some of them we're not even aware of about how to design interactive tablets and games. So if I'm building something for kids here, I have all these things that I'm not even aware of that I've built up over time that just immediately end up in the game. So that seemed like, okay, let's go. Let's start this process. However, when I first visited the school there, um, I was taken on a little tour, and someone had donated a play sandbox. Are you guys familiar with that? The sandbox and the little animals are in it, and then kids get to talk about all the bad things that have happened to themselves, and it's part of therapy. It's supposed to be a very successful approach to helping traumatize kids. So um, there's only one little problem with this, and it was very tidy and didn't look like it had ever been used, was that um, the kids wouldn't pick up the animals at all. And they certainly wouldn't use them to talk with because in Nepal, animals are farm creatures used for labor. Cows are sacred with ferocious horns that wander in and out of people's houses and children get stabbed and gored quite frequently. Dogs wander around in aggressive packs that roam around biting children, attacking them. Tigers are definitely not a good thing to run into in the woods. So what did I learn? No talking animals. So it got worse from there. And what I realized um, fairly quickly after I'd been there for a few days was I, everything that I knew about designing interactive technologies for children wasn't going to work. Um, so that's how I came back to my team and said, everything we know isn't going to work. I, do you want to do this project? Um, and so they did. So we needed to find out about their world. Context is everything. So we spent time there. That's the only way to do it. Well, I spent time there and one of my grad students. So we immersed ourselves in it. And um, we spent time in the slums. We spent time in a nearby Tibetan refugee camp. I took a lot of pictures. It's a good thing I'm an amateur photographer because those pictures became extremely useful in our design process back home. I spent time with the kids. They're awesome. They don't go to school, um, but they play lots of games, which was a really good starting point for me. So I found out a lot about the games they played. And also I found out a lot about what was familiar to them in their daily lives so that I could try and leverage those things and use those things and make a game that was familiar to them. Okay, so 
if you're familiar with design, you get to this point where you create a user profile, and ours went like this. Well, they can't read, they can't write, they can't count in the poly, they don't speak English, they've never seen a tablet, they don't know what a computer game is, they don't know how to change their brain or their physiological state. And then if you add the other quote on about how most of these kids respond on any given day when they get up in the morning and get beaten and sent off to school, that's our design challenge right there. So, on the other hand, I said, well, I want to teach them how to relax. I want to teach them how to focus their attention. The system has to be really easy to use. You know, they pick it up, they can use it right away. It needs to be familiar to them. I need to reward their brain state changes, show progress. Oh, and we need account management somewhere in there, too. Okay, so what I'm going to spend a little bit of time on um, is the conceptual design, which is most of the part that I led, figuring out how do we do this? How are we going to make this work? Okay, so the first thing that occurred to me was how to create user accounts. So how many of you log on to your laptops every morning? Okay, so these kids can't do that, um, but they need to have their own account. They need to be able to track their progress, and they, can't, they have no idea how to do that. But when I was running the workshops, I realized that handed this group of girls an iPad, and they very quickly figured out how to take their photographs. And it turned out when I was in the slums that the kids saw a camera around my neck and ran up to me and begged me to take their picture, and could I come back a day or two later and give it to them. And these photographs that tourists take of the kids become cherished items. So they do know what a camera is, and they can very quickly figure out how a camera works on an iPad. So that was my first solution. So user accounts are simply um, camera pictures. Just use the camera. So to access your account, you simply touch the picture of yourself. So far, so good. Six-year-olds can do this. Okay. Oh, now we have to teach them how to relax. Okay, so what I there's a design principle that I came up with for all these games, and what I wanted to see is that I wanted something that was familiar from their everyday life, and I wanted them to see it on the tablet, a picture of it on the tablet, and it would make them do something just like they would do in everyday life. And doing that thing would change their brain state, which of course would feed back into the computer and then change what was happening on the computer. And so they would see that they were doing it right, and it would encourage them to do it over and over again. So there's a lot of pinwheels in the markets there. They cost about a cent each in Canadian dollars. Um, so lots of children wandering around with pinwheels. And so when we play, um, so we design on the tablet. This is a picture of our tablet. And we have a girl there, and she's blowing on the pinwheel, and the pinwheel spins. Okay, so what we then do is the girl disappears and leaves the hand holding the pinwheel. And we say to the kids, what are you going to do? What would you do? Yep. Or you blow. And what happens when you take a deep breath and blow it out slowly? You relax as your bodies, and then what happens to your brain waves? They go down into slower and slower states. And so the headset picks that up, it wirelessly transmits it back to the tablet, and the pinwheel starts to spin. And so the children, of course, think that the blowing on it makes it spin. It doesn't really matter that they think that at this point, but they quickly learn how to use it. And so the very first game is simply about learning over and over again how to get the pinwheel to spin. And you collect a jar of them. So each time you get one, it fills up your jar. So that was the first thing we did. And we worked on this with the counselors. They said a lot of times the kids come in and they're just a mess. We just need to get them down a notch. That's it. So this is the get them down a notch game. Okay, but then it didn't end there. They said, well, you know, it'd be really great, too, is if you could actually teach them to hold that relaxed state over time. So, okay, what are we going to do? So it turns out in the Annapurna region, um, there's a lot of ecotourism. And while people are sitting around waiting to go trekking, they go paragliding because there's a lot of mountains. And the kids who are hanging out in the fields lie there and relax and watch the paragliders. And the paragliders swoop up in the thermals, and then they land. And you see these kids kind of watching them. And every kid there knows what a paraglider is and what they do. So that gave me an idea. So in this game, and this um, doesn't quite show it, but usually there's a little girl on the side, and she's lying back, relaxing, and doing some deep breathing. And so the animation shows that as she's lying there in the field, watching the paraglider, he swoops around, or she swoops around a little bit, and eventually lands. And then it's the child's turn. So what do they need to do? 
Okay, lie back and relax. And slowly the paraglider comes down. And if they lose attention, it swoops back up in the thermals. And they do it again until they get it. And this is much harder. And they do it again and they do it again. And eventually they get tokens in the jar for success. So that's again about teaching children how to stay relaxed. And we can set how long it is. We can say they have to stay relaxed for five seconds or two minutes, whatever we like. And we can change the levels of it. Okay, so far so good. The last game was the hardest to design, and it has to do with holding focused attention. So this is the game um, that also would help kids with ADHD. So a lot of these kids, they live in the slums by the river, and um, the adults that live there are illiterate. And one of the jobs they do is they walk down to the river, and they fill their baskets with rocks, and they carry these rocks on their backs up the cliff to the side of the road, and they dump them on the road, and then they go back and they do it again. And they do this for 10, 12 hours a day, and they earn about 10 cents a day for doing this. And it's the only way they have of earning a living. So the kids are very familiar with this, and we saw a lot of it going on. And the kids sometimes just sit there and watch the adults, or they help um, piling the rocks into baskets. So we're redesigning this game, but right now what happens? So if, you, if a rock goes up and crosses the screen and towards the basket, and you have to watch it, as you watch it, what happens to you? What's, what are you doing? You're focusing. And so your brain is focusing as you do that. The minute you look away from the rock, the rock drops down, rolls back the pile, start over. And so it's a very simple activity that they know how to do, um, and it helps them develop focus. OK, a few other little things we needed. Uh, we needed to show progress for the kids. So in every little house there, there's always these little rows of jars and containers, and they collect stuff. And so that was really easy. It's like, ah, the kids simply have to collect stuff. So this is the kid's status page. It's got their photo. It's got little icons for the three games that they totally understand. And they fill up their jars. And over time, they see how they're doing. We have a teacher page that shows progress over more time. The teachers wanted to know what percent of the time that the kids were playing the games they spent um, in relaxation or focus. So we just show it as a circular graphic chart. They can see immediately here, going this way, that the child's getting more and more of the time is spent either relaxed, which is the orange, or um, focused, which is the blue. And the kids can also see, look how many jars I got in any given day. OK, so that's the conceptual design. That was figuring out how we thought it might work. So then a year happened, <laughs> and we built it. Um, and that was no small challenge. And now we have a functioning system, which Aaron is going to try and demonstrate live. And I have to warn you that demonstrating how to relax live in front of a group of 100 people is not the easiest thing in the world. Um, but he's going to give it a go for us. Looks like he's connected. We have a little debugging thing so we can see what's going on. Um, looks like he's connected, so I'm going to be this person. And this is the animation. So it shows this is what you're supposed to do. So the child watches this, and then she disappears. And now it's his turn. Jar's empty, and he blows. And there come the pinwheels. So we made it so that it quickly filled up, but in theory, you'd have to do one at a time. Demoing is hard, though, so good job. OK, <laughs> so once you've got a jar of pinwheels, um, the counselor said, after you've done it five times, we can assume you're in a decent state. You can move on and do harder things. So we get to this screen where the child can choose what they want to do next. They can go back and do pinwheels, or they can do paraglider. It's a little harder. So first, we have the animation. She's in the field there. And she's doing, you can't see very well probably, but she's deep breathing, her chest going in and out. She's watching this come down. The mountain in the background is the mountain that all children know there. Okay, she disappears, the jar appears, it's your turn.
pretty good with an audience in front of you. <laughs> do you want to do one where you show them going back up? I can try. It was pretty easy, actually. <laughs> Just stop paying attention. Let's see if it'll go up. Although in the demo version, I'm never sure yet. So it's sort of going, mm. We're not sure what's going to happen with it. We told our programmer, could you make it really easy for us <laughs> when, we're, easy. when we're demoing it? So, because um, I had, when I first demoed it, it was set quite difficult and it was, anyway, it looks bad. Okay, so then they can go back here and then play rock game. So this one's about holding focus. And of course, it's a little bit hard for Aaron to do it because he can't see the screen. So why don't you, you might want to look at your screen. So you really watch the rocks going across. You can focus, you could stare at something else too, but the idea of just being really focusing your energy in one place, there's quite a different feeling than being relaxed. So his brain is controlling the game. Oh, almost dropped it. Oh, oh, go. There we go. Thank you, that was great. Well Thank done. You. Is that everything? That's it. At about 10 o'clock this morning, we had this discussion. I was like, Alyssa, you don't want to have to demo it while you're talking, do you? And I was like, no. <laughs> well, so Aaron volunteered to do that, which is just awesome. Okay, so now what? Okay, so we basically have a working system. We're just tweaking it. Uh, our next step is usability testing. We just want to get the kinks out of it. We're, we, we're not going to go to Nepal, Nepal to do that. Um, but we are working with young children with ADHD in Surrey, which is our closest approximation. And I do really want to work with that group. So it allows us to immerse ourselves in what's going on with them, but also test out um, the kinks in our game. So we're working through ethics for that. Thank you. So we're working through ethics for the usability testing with young kids with ADHD in Surrey. That's our next step that will happen this spring. And then we go to field trials in Nepal, which will be the fall 2014, and then the trial with the ADHD kids in the winter. So the kids will, for, with ADHD will have completely different games, but the same sorts of ideas. So there'll be a whole new design process there. Another team, probably. Okay, and so that's the end of my talk, and I um, appreciate your focused attention. And uh, for more information, it's posted on my website. And donations are always welcome to Nepal House Society. They're doing some pretty amazing work with not a lot of resources. Thank you.